There are plenty of villains to be found in the world of Kung Fu Panda, from thieves and bandits who are relatively minor threats, to full-on war criminals who put the entirety of China at stake. My fist hungers for justice. That was my fist. But while each of these villains had to face the Dragon Warrior at least once, we feel they deserve a more traditional and judicial punishment for their crimes. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and today we're sentencing the villains from Kung Fu Panda for their crimes. Now it should be noted that we're not only bringing in the big bads of all the Kung Fu Panda films, spoilers by the way, but we're also going to be sentencing some lesser known villains that we feel still deserve a trial. With that said, court is in session. Now first up on the docket, we have to start with the one and only Tai Lung, said to be one of the strongest Kung Fu warriors in the land. Being both a student and the adopted son of Master Shifu, all Tai Lung wanted was to eventually become the Dragon Warrior. When he was denied his so-called destiny, Tai Lung went mad, bringing destruction to the Valley of Peace and attacking innocent people as well as his own father. Given how strong Tai Lung is, it's not impossible to think that he's killed people without even trying to do so such as during his famous prison escape. While his main goal in that scene was to free himself, we're sure he casually took a couple of rhino guards out permanently along the way. So we have to charge him with manslaughter alongside his escape charge. We're dead. So very, very dead. He's guilty of damage of property, and since he specifically attacked his adopted father, twice, I might add, we'll add on a domestic abuse charge as well. Finally, it's a given that we have to charge him with attempted murder for trying to kill both Shifu and Po. So yeah, we are starting with a pretty lengthy rap sheet here, given that he already received a life in prison sentence that resulted in just more destruction and harm in the long run. We have no choice but to give Tai Lung the death penalty. Had Poe not already taken this guy out the first time around with the Wuxi finger hold, we feel like death by firing squad, or arrows in this case, would have been the quickest and safest way to dole out this punishment. Following Tai Lung, we have another fairly vicious fighter, Boss Wolf. Boss Wolf is the leader of Lord Shen's private army, which makes him complacent in many of Shen's biggest crimes, such as the terrorism he performed against places like Gongman City and the musician's village, as well as the genocide he launched against the pandas. If you mess with the wolf, you get the fangs. Speaking of the musician's village, we can also charge Boss Wolf with several counts of theft for stealing the villagers' iron instruments. Still, as terrible as Boss Wolf is, it could be argued that he was just a soldier following orders. That is a pretty lame excuse in most circumstances, but it at the very least tells us that he won't go out of his way to kill others for no reason. We should also point out that despite being a criminal, Boss Wolf does have a bit of honor in that he flat out refused to fire Shen's cannon on his own men resulting in Shen immediately killing him with one of his own blades. In a world where Wolf didn't die at the hands, or feathers, of his boss, we would give him a prison sentence of 30 years. Not quite life in prison, but still a good chunk of life, given his current age. Additionally, during his time in jail, he would also have to perform acts of community service, such as repairing damaged structures, making new instruments, or doing other kinds of manual labor within the places he attacked as retribution for all the damage he caused. Now, speaking of his feathered boss, next up on the docket is the dishonorable Lord Shen. We meet at last. And oh boy, of all the villains on this list, Shen is certainly up there when it comes to his absolutely massive list of crimes. Of these crimes, the biggest one that can't be ignored is his nearly successful genocide of pandas. Get the wolves ready. We're loading ships now. While Shen was unable to wipe them out completely, he and his army still killed many of them. We're also going to give him multiple counts of both murder and attempted murder. As stated before, he ends up killing the leader of his army. Prior to that, he killed Master Rhino during the demonstration of his cannon. And afterwards, he tries to kill Po, the Furious Five, and the other Kung Fu Masters several times, nearly succeeding when it comes to Po and Tigris. Finally, we have to give him a terrorism charge for his assault on Gongman City. 
Shen is another villain who was killed off by the end of his movie, with it being suggested that he did so on purpose, given the peaceful looking facial expression he has when his cannon falls on him. But if he hadn't died, it's pretty obvious that Shen wasn't going to get away with all his crimes. As such, we feel he deserves no less than the death penalty. And since he's not a strong warrior like Tai Lung was, we're specifically going with death by hanging. Prior to that, however, we're going to force Shen to give up all his wealth, weapons, and other assets, which can be distributed back to the people who lived in all the places he attacked. From genocidal peacocks to stubborn supernatural bulls, next on the docket is Kai the Collector. Once upon a time, Kai was a noble warrior, much like Ugwe. After learning about the power of Chi, however, Kai became possessive of it and became willing to do whatever it took to be the only one who used it, even to the point of taking it directly from others. Hi has returned! Who? Alongside this intent to harm, we have to charge Kai with brainwashing and enslavement thanks to his use of jombies, which are made from the enslaved souls of those he defeats and steals the chi of. Kai then uses these souls as well as his own mighty power to wreak havoc and destruction. We see him absolutely obliterate the Jade Palace out of spite for Ugwe, and later on we see him wage war against the peaceful Panda Village in order to force Poe into facing him. Skadoosh! Skadoosh, skadoosh. Honestly, what makes his little chi stealing habit all the more egregious is the fact that he was willing to steal not just the chi of other warriors, but the chi of innocent bystanders as well. And again, they likely would have been enslaved forever once Kai no longer had anyone who could stand in his way. Really, the only thing saving Kai from a worse fate is his focus on being a spirit warrior, only ever capturing and taking chi instead of straight up trying to kill people. Still, between all the spirits he managed to enslave, and all the damage he caused throughout the movie. We feel like 50 years in prison, specifically uh, spirit prison, is a fair enough punishment. But given that Kai's already spent centuries trapped in the spirit realm, the more important punishment is that during his sentence, he will also be forced to perform manual labor through rebuilding the Jade Palace and repairing any damage caused within the Panda Village. Taking a quick stop over in Netflix land, let's talk about Claus and Veruca Dumont, the main antagonist from the show Kung Fu Panda the Dragon Knight. Although Veruca is more violent and sadistic than her brother, both of these weasels are pretty dangerous. Being part of the mages, a group focused on spreading chaos and dark magic, we'll start them off with a treason and public endangerment charge. Veruca and Claus ended up facing England's strongest royal guards and even managed to kill Sir Alfred during battle. Battle. Later on, when Veruca became the queen's advisor, she tried to assassinate her using poison. If that's not a means to charge for treason, we really don't know what is. Though perhaps attempted regicide is the more important charge. Once Claus eventually freed Veruca, the siblings went on to try and bring together the Tian Sheng weapons, all in the hopes of raising an undead army to destroy everything before recreating it in their own image. During these efforts, these weasel siblings certainly weren't afraid of getting their paws dirty, putting people in danger on a regular basis and even killing others when necessary. All that is to say their mission to destroy and ultimately rule the world really is just the cherry on top of this evil Sunday. For their many crimes and all the innocent people they either killed or nearly killed, we have no choice but to give these two the death penalty, specifically death by beheading, which is not only a very old European European style of punishment, but will also hopefully be enough to keep these two from using their powerful abilities to escape their fate. Given how unstable Veruca became after being imprisoned for 15 years, we can't imagine that putting her or her brother back in jail would do any good. If anything, it may end up putting more people in danger in the long run. Since we've already mentioned him briefly, let's go ahead and bring Sir Alfred of Landris to the stand. Really, Alfred is right there alongside Tai Lung in terms of being a tragic villain and arguably Alfie got even more of a raw deal. He was originally a knight who swore to serve the Queen of England. After his death and eventual resurrection, however, Alfred took his duties as a knight to their ultimate extreme. Once he got his paws on the Tian Sheng weapons, he used them to become a planetary threat, rearranging the continents and using undead shadow warriors to keep the citizens of his new mass continent in line. His extremist views, combined with his loss of sanity due to his traumatic death, made him into someone who believed in enforcing peace rather than simply striving or fighting for it. This meant killing even the smallest time criminal in order to set an example. So yeah, that's definitely a vigilantism charge. You can just add it 
to the list alongside global property damage, mass public endangerment, and attempted world domination. But while Alfie may have had some of the biggest and most harmful crimes on this list, the court can't ignore that he literally wasn't in his right mind during these crimes. With this being emphasized once he realizes just how far he'd gone, leading to him eventually surrendering peacefully. These facts, along with the fact that he's already dead, led us to our final sentencing. A century's worth of mandatory therapy for his own sake, plus a century's worth of imprisonment with a chance for parole, and the allowing of visitors so that he can continue seeing his family. But we'll also give him a chance at parole, once he gets his own mental health in check. While it's always great to see a criminal turn their life around for the better, we still have to briefly talk about Zen. Compared to all the evil warriors and war criminals that we've mentioned so far, Zen really doesn't have a lot to answer for. Being the apprentice of the chameleon, she's complacent in her master's plan, that being the theft of Poe's staff of wisdom. That being said, even when she's working directly under the chameleon's scaly thumb, Zen's still got some sticky paws. She's one of the most wanted people in Juniper City, and from the moment we meet her, we see her trying to steal everything from ancient kung fu artifacts to bags of gold old coins. We also see her partake in gambling and hustling while at Granny Boar's restaurant. It's hard to say just how much she's stolen in her time as a thief. All we can really punish her for is the crime we see on screen. But much like Poe was, we're willing to cut her some slack due to the improvement we've already seen from her, as well as the good heart we know she has deep down. We're gonna sentence Zen to one year in prison with a chance of early parole for good behavior, as well as community service. Though given her new title as future Dragon Warrior, we're sure that last part won't be too much of a struggle. Last up on our docket is the latest villain in the Kung Fu Panda series, the Chameleon. Given her ability as a shapeshifter, it shouldn't be surprising that she's got a pretty wide variety of crimes under her belt. For one, she rules over Juniper City with an iron fist, using her powers and her lizard army to keep the various citizens and crime families of the city in line as she forces them to give her their wealth as tribute to her. We also see her partake in identity theft at the start of the film where she pretends to be Tai Lung in order to get Poe to leave the Valley of Peace. So that's another charge. When she opens the spirit world and begins stealing the kung fu skills of long gone masters, the chameleon also makes sure to imprison each master she steals from so that they can't try to fight against her. We also can't forget to mention the attempted murder against Poe, but at this point, is that charge really much of a surprise? Our final charge, however, is a bit more unique to the chameleon, and that's the charge of domestic and emotional abuse against her apprentice and surrogate daughter, Zen. Whether it's through breaking down her confidence and letting her know who's in charge or just straight up slapping her around during their final confrontation, the chameleon treats Zen really terribly and certainly deserves to be punished for that just as much as all the other stuff. Still, compared to the other Kung Fu Panda bad guys, her crimes are somewhat more minor in scale despite her desire to prove herself to all of China. Overall, we'd say the most fitting punishments for her would be the redistribution of all the wealth and assets that she took from the residents of Juniper City plus 15 years in prison for good measure. We're also going to ask that the court find some sort of magical or spiritual way to bind her sorcery so that she can't keep stealing people's identities. We're sure that if Poe's staff can open up a spirit world portal, it can at the very least do some simple binding magic. 